Hello, everyone, and welcome to another preview show here on the channel. And this is, of course, the big one of the year, the World Championship Road Race for the men. And this is the 88th one, and it will be in Flanders. As always, I'm delighted to be joined by Mr. Critical himself, Ewan. And Ewan, when I say the World Championship Road Race for the men, what springs to mind? Well, what springs to mind is nations. Yes, the riders will not be riding for their trade teams. Instead, they ride for their respective home nations. This race happens in September every year. It is one of the most exciting races to watch on your televisions, incredibly unpredictable, very different dynamics, and we're in the spiritual home of cycling this year in Flanders. For the 10th time in the history of the World Road Race Championships, we will be visiting Belgium, and I'm very, very happy to be here to see some of the fine sights of the history of cycling. So anyways, Ewan, what awaits the riders for this you would thought the amazing course on the homeland of cycling well to celebrate 100 years of the rainbow jersey they will be covering 267 kilometers from the grote mark in antwerp going to leuven the home of stella artois lager of course over the course of this race they will be covering 2000 gain over 42 classified climbs over the routes which includes cobble climbs and the paved ones combined well where are we going that's the big question it's a big spaghetti all around the north of Belgium. We're covering loops in Leuven and also this so-called Flandrian route that takes in much of the roads that we see in the Brabantse Pale. Nevertheless, after 50 kilometers of racing from Antwerp, the riders will first arrive onto that route around Leuven for the first time, negotiating some difficult climbs on the route. After visiting Leuven, the beautiful home of Stella Artois and Catholic University of Leuven, one of the best in the country, we will be heading southwards into the Brabantse Pale country, all around the town of Overeese. This loop will last around 50 kilometers and will feature six tough climbs including the 17% Monkestrat. After the Overdeza loop, the peloton will return to Leuven for four laps of the city circuit before once again heading into Overdeza and those cobbled climbs. With 37 kilometers to go, the depleted peloton will be greeted once again within Leuven for the final time, tackling the cobbles once again before a false flat finish on Heldenaxevest. All in all, this 260 kilometer long route is tough, it's Flandrian, and what more could you want from our road race world championships? So anyways, thank you for that. Uh, the preview of the route, of course, and you and where best to start with. We normally start with the winners of the previous year, but that seems a bit disrespectful to Flanders with the two superstars that they're coming with. Belgium, of course, bringing Remco Venepoel and Wout Van Aert, who got his second place and Remco got his third place in the time trial. But Ewan, do you think this is the team to beat here in Flanders with such a supreme set of superstars and Wout Van Aert has absolutely been lighting this season on fire as well. Well, one would say that Belgium is probably one of the strongest teams on paper. Looking at their lineup, they have some absolutely massive hitters, including Wout Van Aert, as you mentioned, Remco Evenepoel, and I would like to mention hometown hero from Leuven, Jasper Steven, who won Milano Sanremo earlier this year. It looks to be very good and a home victory would be fantastic for this narrative. However, Belgium have not won a World Road Race Championship since 2012, even when they've had riders strong enough to win it. I'm thinking about in 2015 with Rijk van Avermaet, similarly in 2020 with, with Wout van Aert, who could not follow the acceleration of Julien Alaphilippe. So Belgium this year will have a lot on their plate, an awful lot of pressure, which is usually amounted on Wout van Aert and Remco Evenepoel, usually in their home nations. But on paper, Wout van Aert surely is the favourite. After what was an absolutely phenomenal tour of Britain, where he took out four stages and an overall victory, he looks to be the man on form. However, the time trial, he finished in second, just a handful of seconds behind Pipo Gana once again. And that makes me slightly sceptical, because Wout van Aert was the out-and-out -out favourite going into that time trial, so following his tour of Britain form, and he still could not beat Pipo Gana, who was not really showing that electric form going into this World Championship. So I do hold some reservations surrounding Wout Wout Van Aert. And I do think we could see another silver medal on the cards, especially given that he hasn't won uh, an international gold medal since his Cyclocross World Championship in 2018, especially with the presence of Motti van der Poel and a lot of these other riders on this start list. I think Wout Van Aert's going to have a big challenge on his plate. However, Scott, we can't talk about Belgium without mentioning that young man, Remco Evenepoel. I heard you have some intel about him. So according to Belgian press, Remco Evenepoel, of course, is one, well, the second in command and will probably have this more of a freer role, it seems, that he will mark the moves and will attack if it seems like Wout Van Aert is not going to be let off the leash. But yeah, this is two incredible stars. Remco Evenepoel in his own right, he's gone from strength to strength since coming back from his ill and body and also so what some people would say, uh, 
very bad move of putting him into the Giro for the first time since his injury break and then coming back winning the Belgian Tour okay winning the Tour of Belgium you would say it's probably not the biggest challenge in terms of competition it's not a world tour level race as you would say Ewan but he still is showing form and this if you let him off like off the road you might not see him again and this two-pronged attack with Wout Van Aert and Remco Venepoel could definitely be very strong if you let Remco Venepoel go and then just have Wout Van Aert sit back we've seen Wout Van Aert being an exceptional sprinter beating Mathieu Van Der Poel beating Junior Philippe yeah beating pure sprinters as well as we saw in the first stage of Torino Adriatico this year there's nothing really he hasn't shown he can do other than the real high mountain let's also not forget about Remco one thing you have to mention about Remco is the fact that he won Drevenkurs which takes place on the roads all around Overese so Remco knows how to win on these roads and while Fanart could not win the Brabanter Pale which also finishes in Overese so I think it's going to be interesting to see how Belgium pan out a lot of big hitters here on that start list so Ewan, it's very common at the World Championships. We have all these superstars in one team. They aren't normally trade teammates. And Remco Venepoel and Wout Van are two of the biggest stars that we have in cycling right now. And do you think they can work together? We've seen Tom Bonin with Philippe Gilbert. Sometimes that didn't work. We've seen the Italian teams. They normally blow up at the World Championships and not able to work together. And do you think these two riders could potentially be a problem in terms of egos well i know that every rider within this long list is a native dutch speaker so language should not be a problem in communication and so forth on the day in terms of the big hitters in this team yes there are many that don't ride together in fact there are only very few on the start list who actually are in the same trade team and we've seen belgium sometimes in the past not work perfectly harmoniously and this year at the olympic games we would have thought that belgium would have had more cards up there in the finale when they did not and while well, Fanart was uh, the big target in that race. So it'll be interesting to see how this one pans out for them on their home turf. So anyways, you can't say well Van Aert without saying Mathieu Van Der Poel. And Mathieu Van Der Poel, of course, has had a bit of a mix this year in terms of success. Winning the World Cyclocross Championships earlier in the year. Losing Ronde van Vlaanderen, which he thought he was going to win. And unfortunately missing out on his main target of the Olympics. But of course, he did have a lot of success at the Tour de France. And Ewan, Mathieu van der Poel have, has, of course, been reported of having a certain back injury. But do you think the Flying Dutchman could be off to a flyer in Le? Well, I think Mathieu van der Poel comes into this as the second in line favorite for this one behind Wout van Aert. But I would say that Mathieu van der Poel is certainly a man to watch in this race. Unlike Belgium, I think that the Dutch hierarchy is a little bit more set out. Mathieu van der Poel looks to be the out-and-out -out leader. I know someone mentioned before that Balcom Olema could be a card to play, but I'm not quite convinced on that. Uh, so Mathieu van der Poel goes into this with full command of his Dutch squad. The Dutch squad have been very good in terms of their women's racing. And also the men have come very close to taking success in the past years too. So I'm very excited to see what, what Mathieu van der Poel can do. He, of course, won the Brabantse Pale back in 2019. So he knows the roads all around Overese. And let's not forget, he finished second there last year behind Julien Alaphilippe. The finishing circuit in Leuven suits him. Short, sharp climbs and cobblestones. I think von der Poel's sharp acceleration is almost unrivaled within the bunch. So this does look like von der Poel has something to win here. And the characteristics of the course would suit him. Can he go for a flyer? Well, that is certainly on the cards. We've spoken about that before in a different video on the channel. Check that one out above. And from the pool, could certainly do that. And on a route like this, it's going to be attritional and very, very tough for riders to sustain their momentum and their stamina throughout the race. So we'll have to wait and see. No rain is forecast. So I presume we're not going to see a repeat of Yorkshire 2019 when he bonked in the rain and the cold. So from the pool, certainly in the driving seat here for the Netherlands. So Ewan, realistically, how do you think Mathieu van der Poel is going to deal with Wout van Aert and Remco van der Poel if they have this very strong two-pronged attack? We saw he was able to distance Wout van Aert in Flanders, but could he handle Remco van der Poel here as well? And potentially a Wout van Aert that is on more form than he was back in Flanders. I think what Mathieu van der Poel has that the Belgian team don't necessarily have sorted out are teammates. With Mathieu van der Poel at the moment, there's Danny van Poppel, who's going from strength to strength at the moment. There's no chance he's going to finish on the podium, I don't think. But he's going to be a key player in this. He showed form in the Benelux Tour as well. And also here is Sebastian Longeveld, who sometimes pulls out a monumental ride on his day. Of course, he finished on the podium in Paris-Roubaix back a number of years ago. Similarly, we have the likes of Mike Turnerson and Dylan von Weiler, who also are real engines on the flat. So I think the Dutch team are going to control this race 
with a very, very tight fist, which could strangle the hopes of Belgium in doing those long range attacks in what is going to be a very, very attritional race with a lot of climbing, a lot of short and steep tests on this Flanders course. So the Dutch team, I think, will just have to play a very different strategy to the Belgian team. And I'm sure with with everything that Belgians are saying in head news blood and the Dutch speaking press, they could be able to read that quite easily. So anyways, one rider we can't not talk about is of course the defending champion, Julien Philippe, who won a spectacular win in Imola. And Ewan, how do you see the French superstars chances at this year's race? Well, the French team are probably one of the biggest wild cards in this World Championships. They're managed by Thomas Vauclair. They're headed by the reigning World Champion, Julien Alaphilippe, but they have plenty of cards to play. Alaphilippe looked fairly strong at the Tour of Britain, getting close but no cigar to Alphenard. Let's also not forget that Julien Alaphilippe won the Brabant Pale last year, which features very heavily in this year's parkour. And the French team is coming here with multiple cards to play. I'm looking specifically towards Florian Sénéchal, who's going from strength to strength, following his Walter Espanyol victory and also his win at the Primus Classic. Benoit Cosnefoy is here, who finished third at last year's Barbanza Pale and also finished on the podium at the European Championships. He's not afraid of these short, sharp cobble climbs, as well as a recovering Anthony Tourgis of France, who is coming into this following a spell of poor results. But let's not forget that he was an absolute superstar over the past two seasons in Flanders. So the French team really can control this race and be a nuisance to the likes of Belgium and the Netherlands. They don't have quite the big hitter as Wout van Aert and Mathieu van der Poel. Yes, Alaphilippe is a superstar, but he's not quite the Flandrian classic titan of van Aert or van der Poel. So I think the French team here go into this with a strategy that will just be to disrupt and to disturb the uh, the team's going into this with the hot favourite. So France could certainly get on the podium, but with which of those riders, that is the question. You can't say the World Championships without last year's hosts of Italy, of course. They're coming with a very strong squad, including the defending European champion now, Sonny Colbrelli. And Ewan, this squad is very interesting. Gianni Mosca on the bad boy cycling here as well has shown good results at the Worlds before. But do you think that the Italians could potentially come together here and do a good performance for the Italian nation? Well, Italy are not afraid to work for their leader. We've seen this at the European Championships over the past four years, yes. They've won it over four consecutive years successfully. And Zoni Cobrelli is the next heir to that throne coming into this as the leader. Zoni Cobrelli has been winning nonstop over the past couple of weeks, winning the Marco Pantani Memorial Race, the European Championships, as well as the Benelux Tour overall, and a stage win there on his own. So Cobrelli certainly goes into this as one of the hot favorites. If you're wondering about his cobble ability, well, he's always been up there in cobble races. In fact, he won the Romance Pale as well. He took out that victory in 2017 and I think he certainly comes into this as one of the key favorites if it comes down to a sprint well Cobrelli does have the legs on him he's shown over recent weeks that he can go out solo he can hit it out on the hills beating Remco Evenepoel even at some points and I think Cobrelli is certainly going through leaps and bounds in terms of his form and I'm sure this would be a first that we have a continental national and world champion potentially within our ranks. So you and you mentioned in De Brantes Power quite a lot of previous winners and of course one of the Italian teams finished on the podium this year and that was of course Matteo Trentin and do you think potentially Matteo Trentin the UAE team Emirates star could help Sonny Cobrelli or even take a result for himself? Well Matteo Trentin has done very well at international one day racing in the past uh, he scored a top five at the european championships the other week he of course won the european championships on a rainy day in glasgow as well as finishing second behind mass Pedersen back in the 2019 world championships on a rainy day in the north of england so Matteo Trentin knows what to do when he puts on that Italian jersey. And I think that he will be a vital teammate on this stage and could potentially even go for the win himself. He's just taken his first professional win in a long amount of time at the Trofea Matteotti over in Italy. And this form at La Volta Espana in the European Championships shows that he is growing. And you know what? When things get quite unpredictable and attritional, Matteo Trentin is there, just like his trade teammate Alexander Kristoff. So I'm expecting Trentin to maybe surprise people and take a podium place if Zoni Cobrelli has gone too hot too early in terms of his form and how the race plays out itself. So 
This is going to be very interesting for the Italian dynamics. And I'm sure we could be in for another reprise of the Italian national anthem on Sunday. So one of the nations that, of course, has been dominated cycling for quite a number of years now, but they haven't quite done it at the Worlds. And that is, of course, Slovenia. And they are bringing Tare Bogaccia, Primoz Roglic, and a former junior road race champion and under-23 world champion as well in the former Matic Morohic. And Ewan, do you think this small nation of Slovenia with such big superstars could potentially add another cherry on top of this amazing cake that they've had for 2021? Yes, I think they could certainly be up there. I have no idea what to expect from Roglic or Pogacar. We don't really know how they're going to react in this cobble Flandrian style scenario, but I'm sure Roglic especially will take it in his stride. It feels like his style of racing may be waiting to be discovered. And in terms of a leader, well, they look to have Mate Mohoric, who had an absolutely fantastic Tour de France and looked very good later on at the Benelux Tour and also at the Classica San Sebastian. So I'm expecting big things from Mohoric. He likes nutritional race, he rides very smartly. So Potentially, the Slovenian could do something special on this course. In terms of backup, well, Jan Tratnik is here. He rode an absolutely phenomenal Olympic Games road race working for today, Pogacha. And they also have Luka Mezget as well within their ranks, who could go for a win potentially, but we don't know quite how well he can ride on the cobbly hill circuits. But Mezget certainly could be an engine to use up for one of their multiple cards to play. So Slovenia will be a big discovery on Sunday, but I'm sure they will definitely be here uh, to show their jersey at the front of the peloton. So anyways, of course, now we come to my home nation of Denmark, and they have a very strong team, of course, this 2019 winners. And the team, of course, are still mourning the loss of Chris Angersens, and of course, who passed away, and our thoughts are with his family. But Ewan, this team that Denmark are bringing in is absolutely sensational. You've got Kespa Eska in the Ronde van Vlaanderen champion, who also finished fourth at the World Time Trial Championship so recently, you've got Manus Kort, who was absolutely running riot at the Vuelta España. And also Mikel Belgrain seems to have woken up for the right time of the year, as he normally does. He's had a sensational record at the World Champs for Denmark in the past number of years. This team, absolutely phenomenal. Mess Pilsen, of course, here as well. And do you think the plucky Danes could potentially pull off another medal and even get that world title yet again. Well, in terms of the most exciting team award, I think Denmark might be in line to get that one. They have a number of cards to play, as you mentioned, of course, former world champion and last year's Kent Wavelham champion, Mars Peterson, who's going to go into this as one of the front runners. He hasn't quite shown the form over the past couple of weeks, but you never know from, from Mars Peterson. He seems to bring something out at the least expected time. Similarly, Maunus Court has been in the headlines, but I hold a caveat for Maunus Court because he hasn't won a one-day race since 2017. All his wins have come from either time trials or from stages in stage races. So I'm not sure if he's quite the classics rider, but his attributes certainly do lean themselves towards one-day racing. Whilst Kasper Asgrain, the reigning Dronda von Vlaanderen champion, I would say is going to be quite marked at the weekend. So if people look at Kasper Asgreen and don't notice the likes of Mikhail Valgrain or Mads Peterson go up the road, then I think Denmark are going to be quite the threat here. Outside of Maunus Court, their riders do have very, very good one-day racing records and have taken some very, very big races. Mikhail Valgrain, of course, has taken Head Newsblad in the past. Asgreen, of course, Durona von Flandre and Idri Harabeke winner. Mads Peterson, we've mentioned his attributes as well as bringing into the equation Miguel Bial, as well as bringing the likes of Miguel Honoré into the question who came very close to victory at the Classica San Sebastian early this year. So Denmark are going to be showing us fireworks all across Flanders as they have been doing for the past number of years. And don't be surprised if you see a Danibol on that final podium in Leuven. Let's hope so. But of course, you can't say Denmark without looking at our neighbour who is very active right now in the cycling world. And that is Norway, the Recent winners of the Tour de l'Avenir, of course, the Tour de l'Avenir champion is not in this race, but nevertheless, they are bringing Alexander Kristoff, who came very close to the Rainbow Bands in 2017 at the Bergen World Championships. And Ewan, of course, Alexander Kristoff has a phenomenal record in Flanders, Ronde van Vlaanderen champion and multiple podium finisher as well at the race. Do you think potentially the rider from Stavanger could have one good race in him or won the last World Championships to challenge for the top spot. Well, when things get unpredictable, Alexander Kristoff is usually there. Uh, he's a very good one-day racer. Yes, he's 
35, I believe, and looking towards a new team next year, Anton Marche. But he's still a very good one-day rider. He finished third at the Ronde von Flander last year. He's given us some good results over the past number of classic seasons. And Norway come into this maybe as an underrated squad. Of course, on this start line, we also have Marcus Hörgård, who took a stage win early this year at the Arctic Race of Noah. Rasmus Thieler who had a very good early season spell in Belgium, as well as Old Christian Eiking, breakout star of the Vuelta España, and Virga Slake Lengen, uh, all of which have been very, very strong over Grand Tours over the past number of years. So Norway really here enforced in numbers, but we'll have to wait and see if they can really rely on their older leader, Alexander Kristoff. But the way the World Championships work out, especially on a cobble circuit, could mean that it will be very unpredictable and quite surprising in terms of the victor, just like it has been usually with Alexander Kristoff's big wins. So anyways, normally at the World Championships, we normally get a surprise package. Just look at the 2019 edition where Mess Pilsen won, and we could potentially see some of them challenging in the top 10. And Ewan, Who's on your radar with potentially getting a top result at the World Championships? Well, there are plenty of factors in play, but some of the other big favorites could include the reigning champion of the Brabantse Pale, Tom Pitcock. John Degenkolb, who recently finished second in the Eschborn Classic in Germany. Let's not forget Michal Kwiatkowski, the 2014 champion, as well as Michael Matthews, who came close to victory back in 2015 and 17. Elsewhere, we could see Sam Bennett have another shot at the Classics, as well as Jinek Stiba of the Czech Republic. So anyways, now we come to our favorite part of the show, and that is, of course, the predictions round. And last year, we got very close with it between the two of us. But Ewan, who is your podium for this, the 80th edition of the World Road Race? This is very, very difficult. However, I'm going to say that third place goes to Matteo Trentin, second place goes to Wout van Aert, and first place goes to Mathieu van der Poel. However, I would not be surprised. I have the caveat, I wouldn't be surprised if a Dane wins this solo. Which Dane that would be, I don't know, but I could see a Dane winning this one solo. However, for the sake of my list, Mathieu van der Poel is my world champion. Yeah, I'll answer that for you. So my third place finisher is Matic Morhage. Wout van Aert takes second place, yes again, for a second year in a row, in a fourth event in a row at the World Championships. And then Mikael Velgren takes the second title for Denmark at the World Championships. So uh, yeah, what a surprise, me choosing a Dane at the Worlds again. So for this week's bonus round, it's going to be where will the defending champion Julien Philippe finish? And as a fanboy of Julien Philippe, I'll let you go first, Ewan. Well, I will be swearing on my French visa uh, that I think Julien Alaphilippe will finish in 14th place on the day. I think Julien Philippe will finish in 27th place. So anyways, that's it for this preview. As always, make sure to subscribe to the channel and let us know down below who you think will win the World Championships. And make sure to check out our stream that we'll be doing, the commentary live stream of the event as well on Sunday. And yeah, that's basically it. Thank you very much for watching. And of course, have a nice day. <laughs>